The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in Mark chapter 9. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes than to be thrown into hell uh, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire and every sacrifice will be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, How will you be able to make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, for most of 2018, we have been working our way verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. It's really been a remarkable journey and Uh, After this year's uh, work, we find ourselves in chapter (laughs) 9. And uh, we're wrapping up what is a long discourse that begins with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and ends here with this incredibly sobering declaration of the momentous danger of sin. And the great hope of our redemption in Jesus Christ. Let's pray that once again the gospel would grip our hearts. That the spirit would come and move in our midst. uh, That we would be transformed uh, by the work of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we need you. Uh, We need the outpouring of your spirit to quicken us to truth. We we need the outpouring of your spirit to quicken us to be one. Uh, We're we're a fractured people. We're torn asunder by factions and and cliques. And very much like the disciples, we we come to fisticuffs over the most foolish things. And so teach us, Lord, how to walk in your ways that we might be at peace with one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You probably know that uh, the 12 days between December the 25th uh, and uh, January the 6th are traditionally called the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, Usually, uh, during the medieval age, Christian nations would uh, devote this time to mercy and compassion, in light of God's mercy and compassion to us in the incarnation. So each of the days between Christmas and Epiphany uh, was uh, to be noted by selfless giving and tender charity. In fact, in in many cultures in the past, uh, gift giving and selflessness were not concentrated on a single day, but uh, rather, as in the famous folk song, spread out through the entire season. In the first service, I had two kids come up to me and say, could we do that from now on? (laughs) Gifts every day for 12 days? That sounds like a great plan. Um, All of the gifts, in fact, in the song, the 12 days of Christmas, uh, represent some aspect of the blessing of Christ's appearing. Uh, They portray the abundant life of of the riches of our Christian 
inheritance. And the ultimate promise of heaven, uh, they depict the essential covenantal nature of life lived in community and accountability. Now, the familiar English version that we know today with the partridge and the pear tree and the five gold rings and uh, dancers and maids of milking and all of that that is actually a, a, a poetic version of a much older French folk song that was actually used as a catechism uh, with calls and responses in the homes of the faithful. And it's a long way from the partridge and the pear tree. Uh, Here's a translation. Uh, What are they that are but one? We have one God and one alone. What are they that are but two? Two testaments, the old and the new. What are they that are but three? Three persons in the Godhead, unity in Trinity. What are they that are but four? Four gospels declaring truth forevermore. What are they that are but five? Five senses like kings adorning our life. That's got to be better than five gold rings, right? (laughs) Uh, What are they that are but six? Six days to labor as God did. Uh, What are they that are but seven? Seven arts on earth beholding heaven. Uh, What are they that are but eight? Eight beatitudes for virtue's estate. Uh, What are they that are but nine? Nine spheres in heaven uh, our ears to incline. Uh, What are they that are but ten? Ten statutes from our gods to men. What are they that are but eleven? Eleven disciples in succession. And what are they that are but twelve? Twelve and more are the graces our hearts do swell. This is obviously a series of extended metaphors. Extended metaphors that, uh, that root our attention in the gospel of life. In many ways, that's what this conclusion of Mark chapter 9 consists of a series of extended metaphors linking the gospel and the sanctity of life and the fullness of our promise in redemption. Uh, William Hendrickson, in his uh, wonderful commentary on the Gospel of Mark, explains it this way. He says that here begins a series of dominical sayings or, or, or catchphrases, but for the most part found also Elsewhere in Scripture, these sayings are likely repeated here by our Lord other places in the Gospels in different contexts at various times, and that explains their power and their importance. Now, actually, some of the phrases that we run across here in Mark chapter 9 ought to be really familiar to you uh, because portions of this are repeated in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, again in Matthew chapter 18, again in Luke chapter 14, again in Luke chapter 17. But we have a quotation here. Uh, from the last verse of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24. And it's repeated three times here in verse 44, in verse 46, and in verse 48. In addition, uh, we have allusions in this passage to the sacrificial system and the salting uh, ritual in um, Exodus chapter 30 and Leviticus chapter 2 and Ezekiel chapter 43. Uh, Later on, the Apostle Paul will quote from this passage a number of times, uh, making allusions to the ideas in Romans chapter 12, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, in Colossians chapter 4, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. All of that to say... The ideas that are presented here are core principles for us to understand the gospel. What is here is the highlight of why the gospel is so necessary. Now, this is the conclusion of a long discourse. 
that begins with Christ coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration in chapter 9, verse 14. He descends into the valley and he finds chaos there. Uh, His disciples are unable to cast a demon out of a young boy. Uh, Verse 18. Uh, Jesus uh, takes the matter in hand, casts the demon out, and then later tells his disciples that this kind come out only by prayer. Some texts say prayer and fasting. Uh, That's in verse 28. At that point, Jesus takes his disciples and they return to Capernaum. But along the way, the disciples start to argue. Coming to the place almost of fisticuffs, they're so agitated with one another. According to verse 34, they were arguing about who was the greatest. Or literally, they were arguing about which one was the most spiritually mature. (laughs) that Jesus gently reproves them. But, uh, but, but almost immediately, the conversation continues. Jesus picks up a little child into his arms, verse 36. And uh, at that point, the disciples point out to Jesus that there are other disciples of Christ. There but they're perhaps members of that great throng in the feeding of the 5,000 or, or perhaps from the feeding of the 4,000. But, but they're not a part of the traveling troop with the 12 disciples. And the 12 are a little agitated because they're out exercising apostolic authority. They're casting out demons. And the disciples want to make sure that Jesus knows that, uh, that their job is being taken by somebody else. And they want to forbid them from doing this. Once again, Jesus gently reproves them. And uh, he teaches them all through this discourse a series of essential lessons about faith, verse 28. About servanthood in verse 35. About the first should be last and the last should be first. And whoever is not against us is for us in verse 40. And so that brings us to the beginning of this passage, verse 42. And Jesus is clearly continuing his lessons. This is emphasized by the fact that the very first word in the Greek text is the conjunction chi. Kai usually can be translated as and or but. Sometimes it can be used as a definite article, but here it's intended to to be a direct link. We're to understand that what Jesus is about to say is a response to everything that has gone before. Jesus is now going to make his lesson about the kingdom, about the outpouring of his grace and his mercy, absolutely clear to his disciples. And so, he begins with this conjunction, and. He he turns the disciples' attention uh, to to the whole question of all of the ways that they tend to dismiss or minimize or rationalize or justify their sin. Still with the baby in his arms, he says that anyone who would actually bring harm or cause to doubt or to stumble and fall, one of these little ones, he says, it would be better if a great millstone were hung around his neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Again, William Hendrickson takes this uh, passage and he gives a a, a little bit of light on exactly what Jesus is saying. He says, there are always those who would lead Christ's little ones of any age astray. Jesus is saying that even if such a sin is planned against only one of these precious ones, in his sight. 
physical death for such a seducer, death of the most gruesome kind, would actually be preferable. He's saying that it would be better that a heavy millstone be hung about his neck and he be cast into the sea. Then he goes on and he says, Now the millstone that Jesus speaks of is the top stone of two between which grain is crushed. The reference is not to the hand mill, but to the much heavier stone drawn by a donkey. In the middle of the top stone, uh, whether of a hand mill or of a donkey drawn mill, uh, there is a hole through which grain could be fed so as to be crushed between the two stones. But the emphasis here is uh, that with the millstone tied around one's neck and to be thrown into the sea, uh, there is no possible hope for your physical life. But to lose your physical life is far preferable to losing eternal life. Jesus now takes this idea and he magnifies it all the more. This sobering warning is repeated three times in a series of amplifying metaphors. In verse 43, hands. Verse 45, feet. Verse 47, eyes. Jesus says, it is better to go through life maimed than to be whole and hearty and yet destined for hell. He's saying that affliction in the mortal is tragic. But affliction in the immortal is all the more tragic. He's saying that suffering in the perishable is lamentable. But suffering in the imperishable is beyond lament. It is a horror beyond imagining. Now, I said in the first service that uh, that at this point, if you're just a little squeamish, you might want to make a quick escape. Because there is no way that we can read these words and understand what they're saying uh, without a wave of conviction coming over us. What Jesus is pointing out is the horror and the momentousness of sin, which we tend to minimize, which we tend to justify, which we try to slough off. But here Jesus is saying that that sin has eternal consequences that we rarely consider. In fact, punctuating the horror of this idea is the picture of eternal torment that is drawn from Isaiah chapter 66. It's actually repeated three times in verse 44, 46, and 48. The repetition drums into us the sense of the horror. This unquenchable fire is the place where worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus, meek and mild, paints a picture of absolute horror. In 1973, renowned psychiatrist Carl Menninger uh, wrote a book a blockbuster book entitled Whatever Happened to Sin. He was responding to a cultural move away from any concept of moral transgression. The sociologists and psychologists of that day had begun to redefine what Western Christianity had always considered as the sinful fruit of dark and hardened hearts. Instead, they argued that those effects, whether individual or corporate, were due to genetics or social conditioning. 
or economic deprivation or childhood distresses. Matters best addressed politically by social justice. Menninger warned, this ideological rehabilitation of sin will have inevitable, disastrous cultural and individual results. Four years later, in 1977, Alan Chase wrote uh, The Legacy of Malthus. In it, he examined the terrible costs of an absurd new scientific elitism and racism. Academics and scientists from nearly all disciplines had begun to refute thousands of years of wisdom regarding right and wrong, regarding sociopathic behavior, regarding gender and family structures, love, hate, addictions, even life and death. Chase warned that should trends continue, the foundations that made Western civilization's great advances in freedom, justice, and prosperity possible will be destroyed and usher in a new day of tyrannical intolerance and oppression. Both books were largely ignored. And we can look back now on the 40 years that have succeeded the writing of those books and we can point our fingers and we often do and and shout to the rooftops on Facebook and Twitter the horrors that have engulfed us because we have marginalized sin or justified sin or redefined sin in such a way that it no longer has any weight but here's the problem We do it too. All the time. We tend to, for instance, medicalize sin. We talk about addictions, which are incredibly complex and have all kinds of sources and all kinds of roots, but we talk about them as if there are no moral consequences whatsoever to the compulsions that drive us to extremes in our lives. We even medicalize sin in a much simpler way. Have you ever done this? You've been a beast around the house, and everybody knows it, and you excuse it because you've had a really hard day, or you're really tired, or, or, or perhaps you're just hungry, or uh, maybe over the water cooler at work you heard something that, uh, that, that rubbed you the wrong way or was even aimed at you unjustly, and therefore you come home and you excuse your sin because of these circumstances. You ever done that? We not only medicalize sin, we we also pragmatize sin. This is the foundation of the abortion logic. It simply argues that, uh, that you have to choose between the lesser of two evils. Here's a young girl. Her whole life is in front of her. The opportunity for college, the the opportunity for a career, the the, the opportunity to to, to start small and and eventually build her life and to have that interrupted by an unwanted child. So we choose the lesser of two evils. But of course, it's not just in the wider culture that we pragmatize sin. We, we do it too, don't we? You ever done this? Make, make deals with God about your sin? Uh, Lord, I'll, uh, I'll begin to ramp up my repentance later. But I, I, I've got all of this other stuff. I'll, I'll start with the new year. <laughs> we, we explain away all of our pet sins. It's because of a lack of affection at home that I found myself on this website. 
It's because I was abused as a child. It's because I'm facing really difficult circumstances in my life right now, and I have to have an outlet. You come home after a really long, hard day at work. You collapse on the couch, and you dither the evening away, telling your children to go buzz off because you've just had a hard day. We all do this. We justify our sin. We evade our sin. We brush our sin off. But what Jesus says here is the magnitude of sin is so overwhelming, we must not avert our gaze. We must not think that we can play games with sin. It would be far better for us to go through life maimed than to be well and hearty but condemned to that unquenchable fire where the worm is never extinguished and where torments are forevermore. Jesus is driving home to us how significant the weight of our sin is. Years ago at Coral Ridge, when I was... uh, subbing for Dr. Kennedy over the course of the summer, I had the bright idea of doing a, a, a series of sermons. I, I, I titled them the, uh, the H Word. And I, I decided I was going to do a whole series of sermons on hell. After the first one, I had a whole bunch of people come up to me and say, wow, I've never heard a sermon on hell in my entire life. And my first thought was, oh, tisk tisk. And my second thought was, you know, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon on hell before today. <laughs> it's not a subject that we'd like to dwell on. And it's not the sort of subject that we expect Jesus to wax eloquent on, quoting from the Old Testament, bringing in all of these references, using these uh, rhetorical and poetic tropes and yet this is something vital for us to hear our sin matters for all eternity it's a matter of great consequence in verse 49 Jesus now closes his discourse And this time he brings good news. He closes the discourse with a promise, a warning, and an exhortation. The promise is this. Despite the weightiness of our sin, or perhaps we should say in the face of the weightiness of our sin, God Almighty in his eternal mercy has made provision for us. We foolish sinners, we who have, who have stumbled along the pathway of life, committing error after error after error, getting second chances and third chances and fourth chances, with blaring warnings, he makes provision for us. Now, Jesus reminds the disciples of all of the Old Testament sacrifices, he, he, he reminds them that everyone will be salted with fire. He reminds them that every sacrifice will be salted with salt. This is a reference back to Exodus chapter 30 and Leviticus chapter 2 and Ezekiel chapter 43. It's a declaration that God in his loving kindness has made a way for us. And, of course, Jesus is pointing to the fact that all of his discussion with his disciples about the Son of Man becoming the perfect sacrifice for all men, betrayed, denounced, mocked, scourged, killed, and raised again on the third day, he would be their spotless Lamb of God. 
So in the face of the horror of sin, in the face of an unquenchable fire, in the face of, of, of the worm that does not die and a fire that is not quenched, Jesus says, there is yet hope. Now, God has made a provision for us. As the Apostle Paul would later say in Romans, they, God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the promise. The warning is this. Verse 50. Salt is good, but if salt loses its savor, if salt loses its saltiness, how will it ever be salty again? Here Jesus is reminding his squabbling, faithless, (laughs) the foolish disciples, these jealous men who don't want the kingdom of God and its privileges to go any further than the circle that's drawn right around them. He reminds them that that this grace comes to uh, them as favor from the Most High God. Here's the miracle. They did nothing to deserve it, to earn it, to warrant it. Therefore, he exhorts them, remain in it and let your saltiness be known to all. Let that savor preserve you and preserve the world around you. And then there is this exhortation. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Here, Jesus says to his squabbling disciples, you know what you need? You need the gospel. You need the salt of the gospel. You need the outpouring of the spirit. You need to be transformed. And so he exhorts them to be one in him that they may be one with one another. And the extraordinary thing is, What Jesus was telling them was that they, who were dead in their trespasses and sins, would be made alive, but not made alive to do whatever they wish. They were made alive as living sacrifices. Because it's the sacrifice that is salted with the salt. It is the sacrifice that has the fire of purification. So he's pointing them directly from the idea of redemption to the idea of discipleship. It's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 12, isn't it? I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's the gospel. Here we have the beauty of the gospel. The magnitude of sin is met by the extraordinary greater magnitude of the gospel of redemption. What looks like terrible bad news becomes suddenly the most glorious good news of all. I really loved the way that this little French folk song ends. It ends, What are they which are but twelve? Twelve and more graces that our hearts do swell. Grace abounds. Grace abounds to the least and the last. Grace abounds to foolish sinners like you and me. And if you're sitting here, And you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that your life is a miracle. That you're sitting here because of God's good providence. That he has seen you through thick and thin and thinner. 
then this is the great call to you. Lay hold of his 12 and more graces and live. This is the hope for our culture. This is the hope for our families. This is our hope for broken hearts, shattered lives. This is the hope for us. The gospel is true. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.